annoyed. There you go. What's up, Basil? How are you? Doing good, doing good. Hello, everybody. Oh, we're going to do a special Thanksgiving edition of Scripture Study. Typically, when we were doing these in-house, we would kind of skip the holidays. And yeah. uh, I think since we're doing this online, we don't have to do it on a Sunday. So we're actually doing this on uh, Black Friday. Black Friday. I've already <laughs> been I've already been shopping. So, uh, um, But I think it's important because what we want to talk about uh the, the first sunday of advent which is which is what it's about um it's a new year it's a new year um we're in year b we have three years a b and c and we are uh, rolling into year b which it shifts the readings and the gospels and everything else yep so uh the readings today are from Isaiah in the first reading, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians in the second, and we begin reading the Gospel of Mark because we're in year B. Matthew was predominantly year A, and the Gospel in year B will be Mark. So let's start with a prayer. And since we're going to be talking about Advent and we're going to be talking about Mary, I thought we could just say a Hail Mary. There you go. In the name, in the name of the Father, Father Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Son, Holy Spirit. And as always, we ask the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts so that when we speak the words of God, that we speak what he wants us to say. Yes. There we go. Amen. Amen. So I mentioned the church year. And one way of looking at that is a circle that continues forever, like a clock, I guess you'd say. The the 12 months are on the outer ring. You can see January and February at the top and rolling around like a clock. And we have different colors representing different seasons in the church calendar. The predominant largest one in the bottom in green is the ordinary time. That's the 34 Sundays we just went through. Right. And that writing in uh, red for Christ the King at about the 9 o'clock position, that was just what we did last week, I believe. And then yep. now we're into late November, early December in the purple Advent season. So that... I, I think it's important to say that uh, ordinary time is not necessarily ordinary. You know, anytime you, you hear that ordinary time, oh, it's just regular, ordinary whatever but every time we read the gospel there's something that we need to learn and there's a reason for it and so when we're getting into advent right now we're preparing ourselves and we're going to we're going to you know go into what we're preparing ourselves for but that is the preparation the beginning um we're preparing for the end in essence Mm -hmm. and and through the whole year uh that that preparation is placed upon our heart through all of the readings and everything that we have, okay, whether it be Christmas, Ordinary Time, Lent, whatever, Easter. So I think that's kind of important. Every season is important. It's not just... Yeah, the, the Ordinary Time is, is actually speaking about the life of Christ during his three-year ministry, so mm-hmm. it's not unimportant. Not it's at all. The not ordinary it's, time. it's not... Yeah, just when you hear ordinary, it's like, oh, it's just ordinary. Yeah, it's, it's, but Christ is always super ordinary. So let's focus on Advent. So that's their season we're entering. Uh, it's a period, and, and I've had some words here used to describe it, um, hopeful anticipation. Mm-hmm. So there's a degree of hope, that, that acknowledgement of something good is coming and we believe it is coming. And then expectant waiting so we're expecting something to come because it has been promised to us. Joyful preparation. So, you know, one of the reasons there's a purple in Advent is, you know, in the older days, it was kind of a, a cleaning of the house, cleaning of one's soul, getting oneself prepared uh, for the coming of the Lord. And we'll see in, in what means uh, the, coming, <coughs> or the coming of the Lord we're talking about in the next slide but that joyful preparation, we're preparing for the coming of our Lord and we're happy. We're, we have this sense of joy that is more than happiness in mm-hmm. expectation and preparation. And then we're reflecting on the coming of Christ. And I wrote, which ones? Uh, and, and by that, I mean 
there, there's more than uh, one coming of Christ. That's exactly right. And typically during Advent, I do it myself, as we're thinking about only one of those. So here's the, the one we typically think about is the incarnation, when Jesus became man, uh, the birth of Jesus. And so that is one of the comings of Christ. And, and it's it's only natural to think that because what are we heading up to? I, I always <laughs> we always relate the seasons. Uh, you got Thanksgiving, and then boom, you got Christmas. Mm-hmm. You're going right into it. But the seasons in the church calendar um, are broken into some very important things. Where uh, Thanksgiving is a secular celebration, um, it kind of signals right there at the end of the year. Yes, we're over with that year, and we're beginning a new year. And liturgically, and, we are. And liturgically, right. we're beginning a new year. That's exactly right. So y- your natural <clears throat> inclination is, well, Advent is the preparation of the birth of Jesus and Christmas and all that kind of stuff. But it's not and it's true. just yeah. that. So it is, I'm going to skip one bullet down, and it's also preparing for Christ's second coming. Right. And, and that would be at the end of time when God chooses... To say that we're done and the earth is done, the universe is done, uh, I'm coming back. And Christ will come back in that second coming and the general judgment will happen where all souls will know why people went to heaven, why people went to hell. And uh, the people that are left will be judged at that point. I think uh, I think the aspect of the second coming is the most important part of Advent. It's stressed. A lot more, and yeah. you'll see that in, the in readings. today's yeah. readings, and we'll see that for the rest of Advent. We're yeah. going to see that that eschatology or the the uh, the end time type of readings, the apocalyptic type of readings. Yeah. So we are going to see that, and that's that's kind of uh, thrust upon us as we read through here. And then the the middle that I skipped over was welcoming God into our lives every day. God in the form of Jesus, I guess you'd say. Yes. And that, that, that is another coming of Christ that we want to reflect on. We want to prepare ourselves for, which is that daily uh, involvement of Christ in our life. And so that's yet another coming of the Christ. So we're dealing with past, the incarnation, the present, which is welcoming Christ into our lives, and then the future in joyful expectation of the second coming. Right. So it's, it's all of those things bundled up into one. That's, that's the Advent season. Uh, Lent was also purple. Yes, But that is. is more of a focus on repentance, whereas Advent is a season of hope. Now, in the older days, uh, there were kind of strains of Lent or some thought of repentance and, and, and uh, preparation involving repentance. Uh, so that's why they're both kind of purple. Well, it? And, but, but two, it's a time of, um, well, really it's supposed to be a time of not necessarily repentance, but giving up things in preparation for, you know, Advent is to... to focus on the and, coming of Christ. And what we'll see is we'll be watching for it, too. And watching, yeah. that's exactly right. And, and you even have uh, a third of the way through it, a resting Sunday, mm-hmm. uh, just like you do in, um, in Lent, mm-hmm. yep. uh, which I can't, I'm having a brain hiccup. Uh, was well, Gaudate Galgata, yeah, that's it. Sunday. Gaudate, in, in Gaudate in, uh, Sunday, which is in Lent, but... I don't know what it's called. No, that's a, that's the Advent. It's in Advent. Third, the third Sunday. Yes, yeah. it's Gaudete. Mm-hmm. So, what is the one in? Uh, uh, no idea. <laughs> I, I, I get them mixed up. So oh, Gaudete, which there, actually it, I have, I usually play a pretty good song called Gaudete, and it's a. So there's some there's some relationship between uh, what we do in Advent and what we do in Lent. That's yeah. kind of the perspective of why there's a purple for the color there. So what is Advent about? And, and this is, you know, we're all guilty of this, that it's not about yeah. shopping or stressing, like or stressing or planning right. or buying, but it is about expectations of Christ coming, waiting, and it's, a, it's more of an active waiting, I would say, than a passive waiting, uh, hoping and praying. So those are the things of what Advent is. And, and it's good that we have that because... 
you know, just like we just like I did today, a Black Friday, I'm out shopping, I'm getting the good deals, you know, we're we're preparing, we're putting up our Christmas lights, we're, you know, baking the Christmas cookies, we're doing all of that kind mm-hmm. of stuff and uh, but it's good that the church gives us these seasons to help us to get us prepared and to prepare for the coming of focus. Christ. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, focus. It's a good word. Get focused on him. All right, so one thing we may not pay a lot of attention into is the role of Mary in Advent. Yes. And uh, therefore, we're going to today. (laughs) So we'll kind of talk through these things. What was her role in salvation history and her role in Advent? Uh, and, and, And then basically that Mary says yes. I think it's that fiat. It is. Let it be and, done unto me according to thy word. And, and, and that in and of itself, to me, to me, that's probably the most, uh, one of the most important lines in Scripture coming from, not from Christ, yeah. but coming from somebody that is a follower of his, mm-hmm. um, which she is. She was the first follower of his. Um, and the reason I say that to me, that's the, because we should be saying that first thing when we get up and prepare ourselves in the morning, when we prepare ourselves to do whatever we're doing, let it be done according to your will and not mine. And yeah. that's why, you know, when, when we always, when I always pray to the Holy Spirit, I'm asking that let his words be given to Mm -hmm. people that I'm speaking, not mine, because I want to try to interpret Scripture the way I want to interpret it. But nonetheless, I think that's that's kind of, that's very important. And I like the second part, too. It's not just a passive yes. It's, I've got a mission, and she leaves in haste to go do the mission. It's exactly right. She, 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 without any worry about herself, she's got to get going. So we'll look a bit about these uh, parts of Advent uh, called the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, and the Epiphany. And I'll kind of have a slide dedicated to each with some artwork. Uh, so the Annunciation, and I'm, I'm going to lean on uh, Mitch here. He's the, the Marian... Uh, I like Mary. Mary. <laughs> yeah, so I'm definitely a, a Marian uh, a person uh, for for various reasons, and one of the biggest reasons is because as a convert, you know, the only thing that I knew about Mary coming coming into the church was that she rode a donkey and gave birth to our Savior. Uh, I didn't realize the the fullness of her life and what mm-hmm. she did. I mean, even even uh, the Magnificat. Yeah. And she says she's a handmaid of the Lord. And, and you see all of these things that she says that Christ is talking about. Or, you know, he's talking about <clears throat> giving, giving us the, uh, the, the examples or the, the, the parables of the handmaids mm-hmm. to have their oil lamps full. Yeah, for just um, two or three weeks ago. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so she, to me, is that perfect example of being a follower, a follower of the way, or a follower of Christ. And then we look at the Annunciation, and at the Annunciation, when the Holy Spirit came upon her, uh, the angel Gabriel said she will, you know, uh, bear bear the, the, the Messiah, God. the Mashiach, uh, as they say in Israel. I just like saying that word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, that and she said, that's when she gave her fiat, yeah. was at the Annunciation. And here we are with the art work showing the angel Gabriel and other angels surrounding Mary and he's uh, actually extending a uh, flower to her yes and in, then in, 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 you know in that offering or that announcement of being the bearer of God and that's why we say holy Mary mother of God mother of God and that's and there's a mystery there but <laughs> there, there is that's a, and that's kind of an important thing too mm-hmm. um, um, when we start talking about the dogmas of Mary mm-hmm. and why they, why we have those, and in the we church. will get there. The next slide after the Annunciation, and this is where she went in haste, was to visit Elizabeth. Right, and this is a, a iconography, and it is showing Mary greeting Elizabeth, and of course, in the womb of each reside. I guess on the left is Jesus. And on the right is John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So we see here um, the visitation of Mary greeting a much older lady, 
to help take care of the older lady while she gives birth to John the Baptist. And I think that's a good example of showing what Mary <clears throat> Mary gives of herself, like we should. She's going to help um, her cousin, and uh, her cousin is older. And this was a long journey. It's a very long journey. It's I think exactly it was 80 right. to 90 miles or something. Without and any without any concern for herself. You're yeah. exactly right. And And she goes, and she goes to help. And mm -hmm. again, showing that Christian example to go and to help in the situation of need. Yep. Then I guess fast forward, oh, eight, seven, eight months, and we have the nativity. Right. And right here, I guess I like the artwork where it presents the baby Jesus as the light. And yes. Everything else is kind of darkness except in the corner where you see the star, which is leading what is going to be next at the epiphany. But uh, you see that, that brightness, that light is coming from Christ, coming from the infant. And, he, and the other thing, too, with the nativity is, again, the humble beginnings, mm -hmm. you know, coming from a stable or a cave, however the, the, the description is at that particular time. Uh, uh, you know, Mary had to, had to prepare for the coming of a king in the best way she could, in humble forms. Yeah. Uh, and she did that and uh, uh, created a stable uh, or a, a manger, trough. a yeah. trough, where, again, everything is symbolistic, or not symbolistic, the Eucharist is real, but, I mean, the symbolism of the the trough being a place for animals to come eat mm -hmm. and how we we place the the child Jesus in the in the trough for us to take of him in consumption again uh, uh, prophetically showing what he was going to do for us in the Eucharist okay and then the 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 last one which deals with uh, the incarnation and, and everything else related to the beginning of the life and ministry of Jesus is the epiphany so there is when yeah. the three kings are uh, journeying along the route to see Jesus and they come upon him and so it says a, the epiphany was like a manifestation uh, a revealing of of Christ to the outside world, I guess these yeah. these kings were pagans, and searching for this king, and it is revealed to them, and and God is made manifest. Were they this. pagans? Uh, they were thought I mean, to be there's, Persians. There's and, some talk that uh, they could be descendant or Jewish, uh, descendant from Daniel. Uh, in the east, you know, where I don't know. I, there's a lot of different different things about that, but that's yeah. The epiphany is, and that's uh, the epiphany is the last day of East uh, Christmas. Twelfth day, is that right? I think so. It's like the sixth of the January. Twelfth day of Christmas. The twelfth day of Christmas. <laughs> yeah, partridge in a pear tree. Yeah. So now you know. Now that we see, you know, Mary's pretty important during this time very frame. Important, uh, very important. Not, not the center, but right there with walking with Jesus and, and, and a every, part of Jesus. Yeah, yeah and everything we, we're talking about with Mary here is his first coming, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and that's very important, but Mary's role does not end there. Her role is also going to play a part in the second coming, a big part. So along with these parts of, I guess they're even mysteries of the rosary in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. the, we're going to look at the dogmas of Marian devotion. And there's four of them today in the church's history. Uh, the most recent of which was in 1950, proclaimed to be so, I believe. Mm -hmm. That was the Immaculate. Conception? Oh, no, no, no. Or Immaculate was Conception was before that. That was in uh, the 1800s. In fact, uh, well, let's go Let's go through all of okay. them here. So which one do you want to start with? Um, Immaculate Conception is coming up. It is. On December 8th? Yes. It, okay. uh, is that the Immaculate? Or is that, it's coming up pretty soon. Or is that in January? Hey. Um, so, I mean, we can start right there. Yeah. And go through. So, so the Immaculate Conception uh, of course, is is not a lot of people get that confused with uh, the, the incarnation, the incarnation of Christ, or the Annunciation, I guess. But the Immaculate Conception is a dogma. And again, a dogma is something that the Church has designated an official teaching 
um, of the church, okay? To be believed by to be believed. practicing Catholics. That's yes. exactly right. So um, the Immaculate Conception is uh, the conception of Mary, uh, uh, between Mary's mother and father. Yep. The, 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 so what Jesus did... And Jesus, and during that conception, it, she was kept free from kept free the stain from original of original sin. sin. And and of course, you know, we always hear she actually says in gospel that she talks about her savior, which is Jesus, her son, and that is true. And this is one of those things that you know you can get into some arguments with as far as um, the understanding of scripture and yeah. how we how we designate her as immaculate conception. But um, Jesus did save her before her conception and I don't know why people wouldn't understand that he had to have a, a vessel a vessel was that was pure because nothing could be before God that's impure so he had to have a pure vessel and he created that pure vessel by wiping or not allowing that mm -hmm. sta that stain to touch her uh, of the original sin now, she's the only one that ever had that yeah. and um so, so she could be a pure and holy vessel. I mean, other than Adam and Eve, which they well, received it later, though. Yeah, but they were the, they were the ones <laughs> that they, originated. They, they yeah. originated the stain. So now we go to perpetual virginity. Uh, that, that kind of flows back to uh, to uh, the, the um, to Isaiah and the prophecies mm -hmm. of the Messiah being born um, of a virgin. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this goes back again to the prophecies and. Uh, it is the teaching that that Mary was not, she was perpetually virgin for her whole life. Yep. The virgin birth, she, um, I know it says some things about cousins and brothers. It, well, it talks and, about brothers, but again, when we, when we, there's, there's, there's very, there's very school, there are different schools, either one that when she married um, Joseph, that Joseph was an older man and he had already had kids from another marriage, and these were her stepchildren, stepbrothers of One Jesus. theory, yeah. That's one theory. The other theory is, which I truly believe, is that um, these were cousins and close relatives, mm -hmm. um, which you look back on uh, when you when you read it in Greek or Aramaic or Latin, um, there's not a word, which is kind of weird, but there's not a specific word for brother and sister. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for brethren, which yeah. could mean... Uh, could mean cousins further could away mean all relations. relations. Yeah. So, uh, but the perpetual virginity is that she never had relations, and that's not an unusual thing. In fact, you can go back and look in old Jewish history. Even married couples would be chaste mm -hmm. and married, and they did that for God, and and that was not a that was not an unusual thing back then. So you know it is kind of unusual now. Yeah, but this was this was a practice that actually happened. So dogma number three is Mary's divine motherhood. Again, the mother of God. The mother of God, which and we can go back to, I guess it's the um, Council of Nicaea or Council of Ephesus that they determined what was called the Theokotos, right? Yep. Uh, the God bearer. God bearer. And, and there were, you know, people, I'm not going to say we don't take uh, our faith seriously but those guys back then took it serious they and did. they had processions protests and riots about the mother the divine motherhood of god and they said that is the mother of god to saint some nicholas of the, got in a fight yeah he packed saint nicholas <laughs> santa claus punched somebody because they denied uh, mary's divine motherhood mm -hmm. So took it serious. Took it very serious, and, and I think it's important that we have to we have to state that that uh, because at those particular times there was something called Arianism, which was saying that Jesus as a human was not divine. Yeah, there okay. was not fully God. Not in some fully way. God, which uh, called into question her called, divine mother. Called into question. So when they got her divine, when they when they, sh they said she was the mother of God, um, Theokotos. Then logically, logically, Jesus was Jesus God, was God yeah. is God, and has always been God. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the final one is the assumption of Mary. She assumes too much. No, that has nothing to do with her we'll assuming. Go, something. go ahead. Um, the assumption uh, basically means that she was brought into heaven bodily. 
um, that when we die, we go spiritually and our body uh, decomposes and uh, basically, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I know it's decomposed. Decay. But decay, but, but Jesus, there was a particular word that Jesus, he did not want his mother to have, um, have this happen to her because we have to remember Jesus fulfilled the uh, Ten Commandments, in essence. And mm -hmm. one of the Ten Commandments, of course, was to honor your mother and your father. And so he honored his father, of course, but he also honored his mother. Mm -hmm. And he assumed her into heaven. She couldn't do it herself oh, no. like Jesus did in the Ascension. So you want to make those two distinctions. Mary depended upon, needed everything else from her son. We, and that's, that's another key thing. We do not worship Mary. We have never worshiped Mary. We venerate Mary. We give her, ador not adoration, we give her veneration. We give God adoration alone. And there's two things, and just real quick, uh, Mary is given what's called dulia or hyperdulia, and that means that she is, she's on a pedestal higher than everybody else except for God, <clears throat> the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit then it's her, mm -hmm. okay? She's the greatest creature God has ever created, all right? And then right below her is Joseph, and then below Joseph is all the angels and the saints and everything else. So there is a pecking order there, but, you know, Mary is, Mary is up high as far as the created creatures. She just, is the Just like there's one. a pecking order down going lower, there's too. A, there's so. a pecking order going lower, too. That's exactly right. All right, so good. I, I wanted to capture some of those, uh, how central Mary is to both the season of Advent and the life of Christ. So hopefully we did a decent, yes, and, decent and, primer for that. So. And, and again, Mary's importance in the first uh, coming of Christ, of course, is her, but there is that coming, the second coming, which mm -hmm. she is going to be a big part of. And, and the, the catechism also talks about a lot and what's, what's going to happen with her. And, yeah. Um, so anyway. So just to summarize Advent, and I might skip over a couple of these slides, but basically we need to say no to the world and yes to Jesus. Right and uh, put ourselves on God's time. And, and sometimes, you know, when we're preparing, we're not ready yet. Whenever we're, we're asking for something, we're not ready to receive that sometimes what we're asking for. So we have to put ourselves in or on God's time. And sometimes we'll just have to wait. And that's kind of what Advent's all about. Uh, let's just go ahead and skip that one. All right, so we're gonna go into the first reading, which is Isaiah. I put 63 and 64. That's the chapters that are involved. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, little sections of each of those chapters. I didn't have room to put all that in there. But a little bit about Isaiah. He's a major prophet, one of the four majors. from this. He was from the southern kingdom. He was the descendant of royalty or peace, priestly class. Uh, he was a prophet for a long time, 64 yeah, years. I think he started with Hezekiah and probably ended with Manasseh. Those were the kings of Israel at the time. Uh, he was one of the two prophets. He describes the wrath of God and the destruction that he causes because of people's sin. Uh, he may actually have been martyred, and in an apocryphal writing, a truly apocryphal writing that's not a part of Scripture, it's stated that he was sawed in half. Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of gruesome. Not a good way to die. <laughs> so in this particular reading, we see a pleading for salvation of God's people. He was also a little, he was a little off kilter. He would run around uh, the desert naked. So, you know, back in those days, he, well, I guess in these days too, you see a crazy guy professing, you know, the word of God. Sometimes you're going to be discounted, you know. But. A lot of times these prophets used the material world to prophe prophesy in the name of God in a shocking way. Yeah, that's true. And, and possibly... To, to shock the people into acknowledgement John of their the sins. I mean, John yeah. the Baptist was very key in that. Oh, yeah. All right. You want to read this? Or? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, first reading, Isaiah 63 through 64. You, Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer. You are named forever. Why do you let us wander, O Lord, from your ways and harden our hearts so that we may fear you not? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. 
Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, with the mountains quaking before you, while you wrought awesome deeds we could not hope for, such as they had not heard from old. No ear has ever heard, no, no eye has ever seen any God but you, doing such deeds for those who wait for him. Would, you might, would that you might meet us doing right, that we were mindful of you in our ways. Behold, you are angry, and we are sinful. All of us become like unclean people. All our good deeds are like polluted rags, and we have all withered like leaves. And our guilt carries us away, carries us away like the wind. There is none who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to cling to you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us up to our guilt. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. You know, a good that, long one. That was a long one. That's why I made you read it. So, <laughs> so uh, a lot of to digest there. We'll kind of I just put up some little blurbs to get us to provoke discussion. Um, Isaiah at one point says at the beginning, Why do you let us wander? So this is, you know, when they're in captivity, when they are, uh, you know, they're, they're not doing God's ways and they have been punished for it. And so the, the thought is he's pleading yeah. for, the, for God to rescue. Um, no ear has heard, no eyes have seen. And so, again, it's like everything that, that, that you know, you've spoken about or, or told us, we're not, we're not listening to you. We're not hearing it. We're not seeing it. Uh, you are angry and we are sinful. So <laughs> it's the same old thing over and over again. I mean, even back in these days, it's, and again, these prophets were given this because of the very reason he's talking about here. It's just like Jeremiah or the rest of them. The people were doing stupid things, and he's having to he's having to you know spell that out for them. What 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 strikes me or brings to me is, is the that God has a personality, right? And and God is angry when we sin. There's there's an anger involved. There's and, and like I said, he was one of the two uh, prophets who spoke of the wrath of God. And when we sin and turn away from God, he's offended. And, and you know, it, it is due to that offense that we gave God that Christ was necessary, right. that Christ was the divine sacrifice. It was the, the only sacrifice that was capable of appeasing God's wrath and his anger at our sin. And so that acknowledgement from Isaiah, this this you know this is seventh uh, or eighth century BC that that you are angry and we are sinful. That's that's the first step on the road back is, is the acknowledgement that you're sinful and that you have angered God. Yeah. Why why is he angry? Why do we have his wrath? It's because we're not doing what he wants us to do, and it's a righteous anger. Mm -hmm. uh, good deeds are like polluted rags. So. Even the things that they do well, or they try to do, in God's eyes, compared to the holiness of God, are like polluted rags, like stuff that you, you know, you're done with and you want to throw it away. Uh, they're they're nothing. Uh, and then, you, uh, say, and you think about a polluted rag. I mean, or a dirty rag. Okay, and you try to clean something. And if it's dirty, even though it has, you know, you're trying to clean it and wash it free, you're still going to put dirt. It's kind of like a dish rag. Oh, if you, yeah. you lose a dish rag too long, it's going to get sour and it's going to get gross. gross and everything you, you touch. Clean, you and everything. Yeah. Totally clean it. But, yeah. Uh, even even when if you partially clean it, you're still going to have that pollution on it. Yeah. We're not going to use the other you reference to, that Paul was actually referring to here. Yeah. But you can imagine what the polluted rag is. Yes. You have delivered us up to our guilt. So at some point, God <clears throat> relents. You know, God is always available and ready for us. He's on the other side of the door. All we have to do is open. But at some point, he lets he, us, our, heart, our hearts get hardened, and he lets us do our will because that's what he's given us is free will. 
And that's what he's talking about is you have delivered us up to our guilt. It's kind of like uh, you keep telling them, don't touch that, that's hot. Don't touch that, that's hot. And then you're like, okay, well, you'll find you let out. them touch yeah. it. And it's like, ow, that's hot. It's like, yeah, I know, I've been telling you that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are our father. That's kind of important. So, and, and you are the potter. And That's we are the work. clay, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, one video we were watching before we got online kind of said that uh, there's only two places in the Old Testament where we see God referenced referenced as a father. In, in the Old Testament, that is. In the New Testament, of course, Jesus refers Jesus, to him plenty a, yeah, of times. That's what he calls him. But this is you know, this is somewhat of a prophetic statement here. You're the father. And, and again, Isaiah was, he was more prophetic about Christ than I think most of the mm-hmm. old, uh, prophets. Yeah, but both the infancy narrative with the born of the virgin mm-hmm. all the way to the crucifixion uh, and passion, uh, I think it's Psalm 53. So you are the father and the potter and we are the clay. So is that, that kind of thought of we are being shaped, we are being formed, and if we only turn our ways back towards God, and allow him to form us how we want, right. how we should be, then then we can be the vessel that does his will in the what way he wants us to do it. It's kind of funny if we go back up. I don't know if, you, if anybody's ever watched a, a potter do their job. They got the potter, they, they're doing the clay, and they've got a wheel, and it's turning, and they're, they're using their hands, but it's like God has turned us over to our own guilt. It's if you ever take release of that before you're done, you'll see the the starts, farm just start getting all around. kind of flopping around. Yeah. So without those hands to mold and guide, we just start flopping around and become a distorted looking figure, chaotic, and, and, yeah. instead of the beauty that that God is trying to do. I guess I'm trying to be poetic here, but oh, I think that's I think better that's than a good the ghost reference. Yeah, the ghost. <laughs> we don't want to see that movie again. No. All right. <laughs> no, you're right. All right, on to the second reading. We are in 1 Corinthians. And so where was Corinth? It was a city in southern Greece. And this letter was written about 53 to 54 AD. Looking at the map, you can kind of see up north in Italy is uh, Rome, where Paul wrote to the Romans. Up in northern Macedonia in the middle of the drawing, you see the Thessalonica and Philippi. Those were uh, communities written with, that had letters written to them. Over in Asia Minor, you had Galatia, yeah. Ephesus, Colossa, and then what is circled in the middle is Corinth. And so I believe there was an isthmus, which is a narrow strip of land right That's in right. Corinth, and that was a place that people would move their ships right. from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. It was kind of a safe harbor. Uh, one time I had a little video that showed how they did that. They would roll it on logs through uh, the, t- the one mile or less of land. It was a lot quicker, I believe, to, mm-hmm. to go through that one mile. And less hazardous, uh, too. Yeah, yeah, instead of going all the way around uh, down below Greece. So a, as a part of that, because it was such a, a well-traveled place, it was a sea town and had all of the uh, amenities that were there for people that were in that industry. So it was uh, very varied religions. Had a, I think they had the Temple of Aphrodite there. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> well, it was a it was a it was a port town in essence. I mean, it was yeah. a place where everybody came. All the merchants came from all over the world and brought their own beliefs, teachings, and everything else. And so Paul's writing to that community. This is kind of the first part of the letter to the first letter that he wrote. So I'll start reading here. Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to God always on your account. For the grace of God bestowed on you in Christ Jesus, that in him you were enriched in every way, with all discourse and all knowledge, as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revelation of the Lord, Jesus Christ. He will keep you firm to the end, irreproachable on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him 
you were called to fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, a few things to talk about here. I, I mentioned Trinitarian greeting. Uh, at, at least here you can see God the Father and then God the Son. And, and kind of all through the New Testament, we, especially in the uh, greetings that the letters of Paul have, you see this grace of the Lord through our Christ Jesus. Yeah. And, and so that, that acknowledgement of there being three persons in one nature is the God, is the Godhead. So in him, you are enriched in every way. So I guess uh, in the first one, we <laughs> talked about the good deeds are like polluted rags. Right. So without... Without being enriched or, or given these these things to do, being formed with the potter, these works are useless without God, right? right. Uh, in him, you are enriched in every way. Not lacking any spiritual gift. So that, I don't know what you were thinking about that, but I almost thought kind of confirmation <clears throat> where the Holy Spirit is given to uh, in the sacrament where we are given the, the the gifts of the spirit. Well, and it's it, God does not does not lack in giving anybody any gifts. I mean, that's the whole thing. He is going to he is going to give you you have a gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that's what he's basically saying here. He's not going to lack in not giving you something of that nature. And then uh revelation of Jesus at the end of time. So I kind of gathered that right here as you wait for the revelation of our lord jesus christ he right. will keep you firm to the end irreproachable of the day on the day of our lord jesus christ so again we're alluding to an end time to right. a to a general judgment or to the time when christ comes again and i and, and i guess um we listen to brant petrie and he talks about this all the time but he talks about the writings of paul or an ordinary time don't in essence coincide with the first uh, reading in the Old Testament and the gospel, but during Advent, they kind of do. Mm -hmm. So the church itself has put together uh, during these times that, again, that reflection of what's going on and what to be prepared for. And even in Paul's writings, they, mm -hmm. they put it in that mix. And so keep you firm until the end. That's that last part here where we're talking about um, irreproachable on the day of the Lord Jesus, he will keep you firm. That, that if you have that faith in God and that fellowship with him, you will stay with him. Yes. And while we need, like looking into the gospel, the main word in the gospel is watching. Watching. And that's kind of an active waiting, I would say. You know, we, there's, there's this waiting that's passive and you just kind of sit back and take a nap and then there's watching and that's kind of what is this keeping me firm in my faith until the end that's that active part of it yeah and mind. we'll talk a little bit more when we get into the gospel about that watching aspect of it and what what we need to do so here we are part of our gospel where it starts off is take heed watch and pray for you do not know when the time is just like i think the last couple of weeks in paul uh, the one you said, the one you read, dealt with uh, it being immediate, and the, the fact yeah. that the the thought was he that was people, thinking it was coming. Yeah. People that were alive because right he didn't then. know. Yeah, and and Jesus said, "You don't know when." And then the next week, I think I did the reading, and it was the same letter, a few chapters mm -hmm. or so later, and he said, "Well, those that are asleep will go first; those that are here will go now." But we don't know when. We don't know when. And that's what it is. You do yeah. not know the hour or the day or the time. So the section of Mark we're dealing with, uh, Peruiza, that's kind of a prophecy of the final coming. What was the other word he used? That, that was uh, Apocalyptus. 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 Yeah. And then Something Adventus like was another Latin word. Adventus. Was I that, love these words. Yeah. So that's where we get the word Advent from. Uh, he's giving a warning to the apostles, and as a matter of fact, this is, uh, he tells a parable of a master on a journey, Right. and these are the last words in Mark that he preaches to the apostles. The last words out of his mouth before his um, 
the whole passion. the whole passion narrative right. starts in the very next chapter. So in chapter fourteen, that's where we see uh, the whole passion narrative. Right. So this is the last spoken words before that whole scenario happens. You want to read this? I uh, will do. It. Gospel of Mark. 13, 33 through 37. Jesus said to his disciples, be watchful, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It is like a man traveling abroad. He leaves home and places his servants in charge, each with his own work, and orders the gatekeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore, you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow. Or in the morning, he may, not come, he may not come suddenly and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Okay. Oh, wow. Three times I saw watch. Yeah. Yeah, he's not playing around with this one. So how do we step up our watch? And I have a few things down there. You want to just mention each one of them. Prayer. Yep. So... This, these are kind of goals for Advent, I think, that, that, you know, we step up our prayer life some. And, and, you know, I've ventured into, as a part of going through the diaconate program, we do the morning prayer. Right. So I've also added the Office of Daily Readings. So I'm hoping, you know, I can continue doing both of those. And, and that would be stepping up my game on the prayer life. Uh, Bible reading. Uh, I, I guess, you know, we've had a lot of uh, bad things happen out of this whole corona stuff. Uh, yeah. But one good thing for me has been uh, I've been forced to do a lot of these scripture studies. That's exactly right. And that's the same way with me. And that has forced us to read a lot more. If, mm. In my case, uh, that, that's one of my shortcomings is, is actual conscientious daily Bible reading. But but I've been doing it now well, because of necessity. Read, you read yeah. a lot of other stuff too. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying that that's one the thing I need to work about. on. And I now uh, I've been forced to work on it. Um, another goal or a way to step up our watch would be more mass. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess that would include when available daily mass um, in addition to Sunday attendance. Um in, in other times, uh, going to the feast days like Immaculate Conception, Our Lady Guadalupe, there's, there's quite a few coming up that, uh, that we should be attending anyway, um, things like that. So I had a little sentence here. Let's see. We do not know when the Lord will come. We must be prepared. Vigilance is above all love. A person who keeps the commandments and look forward to Christ returning, for life is a period of hope and waiting. It is the way towards our encounter with Christ the Lord. And so I thought that vigilance is above all love. Absolutely. You know, one of the things is kind of when we start talking about end times, and I get into these conversations all the time because I'm always reading about um, prophetic sayings from um, from apparitions mm-hmm. or from the saints, which you're not required to follow those. Um, they're, they're called personal revelations. And, but if they're accepted by the church, it's a good idea because Paul even himself says, do <clears throat> not you know, throw out uh, any kind of prophetic sayings, but you know, try to make sure that you understand it and it's discerned through the church. Yeah. So, but What's funny is when you start talking about these end time things, sometimes people say, well, you know, you don't need to worry about that because we're not going to know when that is. There's nobody. Well, that's true. We don't know when it is. I agree with you on that. But part of being vigilant is anticipating and being ready. Even Paul himself was anticipating and being ready. Mm-hmm. And so part of that, uh, as far as, you know, we're concerned, you know, is... You look at the signs of the times. I mean, Jesus himself said, you know, as the, the, the olive tree blossoms, you will see. So those kind of analogies he's throwing out at us is to be aware when you see signs. Now, 
we can go look in history, and there's always been bad things that have gone on, and they can always correlate to a potential coming of Christ at that particular time. We are definitely in a time right now that needs to be watched closely, okay? Especially if you look and see everything that's been going on. It's crazy. And all I'm saying is, is Jesus coming next week? I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. But we are looking at times. We are looking at the sign of the times. And so the best thing to do is like Basil put on here. Pray. Ask the Lord to open your heart. Be vigilant. Be ready if that time comes. And let other people know, people that are that are lukewarm they're closed off yeah. to what's happening around them because i mean we can look at these days and times right now basil and you and i talk about this all the time we see people that are like do you not see what's going on in our church there the 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 drop in attendance the the you know especially with covid drop in vocations drop in vocations we've got so many crazy things going on that it, it, it's if we are watchmen, if if uh, if we are watching at the gate and Jesus arrives, he's going to say, "What's going on in there, guys? Have y'all been paying attention? What are we going to be able to say to him?" Yeah, you know, um, and that's exactly what this this reading was alluding to him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like you said, it shift from from this this particular the last things out of his mouth before he went into his. His passion in the first thing Where he, he will in, leave. Yeah. It's exactly right. The yeah. first thing that happens in his passion is, of course, they, it's the upper room and everything, but he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm-hmm. And what happens in there? Yeah, they, they, These guys they, are sleeping. Yeah, I, that's why I put no yeah. naps. You know, no <laughs> naps. That's right. <laughs> we got to keep spiritually fit. Yeah. Those guys fell asleep three times. Mm-hmm. And he had, to, he had to go to them and say, what are you guys doing? Okay, so I think that... You know, he, he that whole thing is speaking to us in that manner, is don't fall asleep on our Lord. He needs you to stay up and pray. Now, I'm not saying, you know, you, you, you don't sleep at all. No, what, what that means is is to stay vigilant in your prayer life. Yeah. You know, don't become lukewarm. Don't lapse in your prayer life. Go to Mass, you know, and do all of these things. Especially right now when you don't have to go to Mass. We've been given dispensation yeah. from, the, from the bishop, and it's very tempting to, to just, say, well, you know, i got other things going on. I've got dispensation anyways. Don't don't think of it that way. Believe me, I have. I've done it. It's like, you know, I shouldn't do that. You know, and and so, you know, that's why we, we have to stay vigilant right now because I kind of think this is one of those wrath times that God is like, okay, well, here you go. We're going to let you. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to take mass away from you because, in essence, that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. And don't let it lull you into a into a you know a sleep a a slumber be vigilant be vigilant okay all right let's end with the uh saint michael the archangel prayer that's uh who we need during these times i think amen brother in the name of the father the son and holy Holy spirit Spirit. saint Saint michael Michael, the archangel Archangel, defend defend us in battle battle. be Be our protection against against the wickedness and snares of the the devil. devil May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. All right. So we're not going to have an in-person scripture study, of course, on Sunday, but we'll be back next Sunday in between the masses, and we'll do that regularly scheduled in person and filming. So, and the other thing too, Basil and I, we we like these little, the way that we do these things, and we need to shift back into that, but we're not going to necessarily do it on scripture. We're going to do it on topics. We just have to figure out a time when we can do that. So we're going to get there, but again, thank you everybody.